Well, good morning again. And uh, it's been a little bit of an interesting week for me. Um, I shared last Sunday uh, when I was up here that um, the night before, so eight days ago, uh, my best friend, his, his son, uh, so unexpectedly passed away. And so I think I was sharing last Sunday that and, uh, I wasn't all here mentally. And so that afternoon, uh, we got our kids down for naps, and Jen and I were sort of just praying for, for our friends and what they were going through, and, and we just felt this really strong impulse, you need to go. And they live in Turkey, the other side of the world. We were like, we just felt this strong impulse, you need to go. So I did something I've never done. I bought a ticket the same day and uh, flew to Turkey and got there on Monday and was there and just got back on Friday night. So it was a, as you can imagine, it was a really intense week, not just uh, from all the travel, but just walking with my friends sort of in their, in their darkest hour. But um, it was a really powerful trip. And, um, you know, even before we sort of get into our passage for this morning, which we will, you can stay in Colossians 2, um, I just wanted to share a few sort of reflections from, from my time over there because this is part of our human experience. We live on this planet. Grief is part of that. And whether it's grief that we are going through or we're walking along someone else who's going through grief, that is sort of universal. And um, again, it was just really powerful for me. And so I just wanted to spend a couple minutes. Uh, a few things sort of jumped out at me. One is that as believers, we grieve, but we grieve with hope. Uh, you're familiar with that passage in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, it says this. It says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. See what he's saying? He's saying there's, there's people out there who grieve with no hope, but as believers, we're different. We still grieve, yes, but we grieve with hope. We grieve yeah. differently. And, and we know this in theory, but, but I actually got to sort of witness that this past week. You know, obviously my friends are crushed. This is the epitome of grief for them. Um, you know, mo most of us can't imagine anything worse than, than losing a child. And yet, and so there's this gaping hole in their lives. The sting of the reality is sort of so heavily upon them. But, but I was really sort of shocked and proud to see how my friends are responding to this in faith. And I, I really think it's God's grace. Uh, they're taking Jesus at his word that he's prepared a place for their son. Um, and that now he's enjoying true, everlasting, real life. Amen. Um, in fact, one of the things my, my friend said to me that stuck with me, he said, you know, dying young isn't the worst thing that can happen. Dying when you die young close to Jesus. Dying far away from Jesus is the worst thing that can happen. You know, because when we're apart from Christ, then there is no hope. Um, but their son had genuinely started following Christ uh, nine months prior, and there was clear fruit of that relationship in his life, and so there's hope even through all of that. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I hear of something like this happening, I always wonder, how would I respond if I was in their shoes? You know, or maybe some other tragedy, or you hear something else happen. Like, and you probably have thought that, like, how would I respond if I had to go through that? Um, and, uh, you know, would, what would I do? Would my faith sort of hold up? Um, and we don't really know the answer to that question, but we sort of wonder that. And uh, one of the things that became clear to me is, on this trip was that my friends, their, their faith sounded very similar to how it had sounded in the past. Which sort of meant to me that the kind of faith and trust that we exercise in life's small problems is the same kind of faith and trust that we'll exercise in life's huge tragedies. There's sort of a direct, a direct correlation between that. You and I, every day, we have all these sort of lots of small little problems, little situations in which we get to exercise our trust, our faith in God. And it's through, uh, it's through that faith and all these little things that sort of a habit grows in our life of how we turn to God in life's struggles. When something doesn't go our way, when, when we're struggling in a relationship, when you get a flat tire, these little, little sort of trivial things that aren't really that big of a deal, and yet we're sort of training our hearts to respond to God, to reach out to Him in these minor things, so that when sort of the big tragedy comes, we sort of have this habit. We turn to God. We run 
toward him when, when the day of trouble comes. You know, uh, God really gives grace for whatever moment we're in. He gives us grace for today. He gives us grace for tomorrow. And in the day of trouble, he gives us grace for that day. To keep, to keep walking, to trust in him. So that was sort of the first thing that uh, sort of really hit me, is how we grieve with hope. There really is a hope of, of real life that is still coming. Yeah. Um, the second thing that sort of jumped out at me is how often our priorities can really get out of whack. And there's nothing like going through grief or walking with someone in grief to sort of reveal that. It's almost like we kind of go through life with, it's, life's kind of blurry, but when we go through something hard, it's like we put on these glasses and everything becomes really crystal clear of what's important. And a lot of times, it's the, the reminder of the priority of people. And how often we lose sight of that. We, we spend so much time on things that don't really matter, and then we neglect the things that really do matter. And yet, it's when we go through something hard, is when we sort of see really clearly how important the relationships are. Our friends, our siblings, our, our kids, our spouses. It's people that really matter. I think this is some of what Moses was saying in Psalm 90, 12. He says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You know, when we feel like we have all the time in the world, it's just so easy to allocate our time uh, unwisely. But when we realize our days are numbered, that we don't know the number of our days, only God knows that, that even tomorrow isn't a guarantee. That sort of affects how we, how we use our time. We live more intentionally uh, in our relationships. The last thing that sort of stood out to me was the, the power of presence in grief. And you've, you've probably experienced this um, for yourself, but there's, there's nothing like just sort of being with somebody, just, just showing up. Um, and this was really amazing for me to watch in the Turkish culture. They, their culture does a lot better job of this than we often do here. We, we tend to think when someone's going through something hard, they kind of want their space. They want to be by themselves. And they may even say that to us. Um, but that's not really true. When someone's hurting, they desperately want to know they're not alone. And there's nothing like showing up that communicates that. And the Turkish culture gets this. When someone goes through something hard, as my friends had this past week, people show up. And for the four days I was there, it was a constant sort of steady stream of people coming through their house just to sit with them, uh, to grieve with them, to listen to them, to tell my friends how much they're loved. It was, it was amazing uh, to watch. And uh, one of my favorite passages on this idea of the power of presence is in the Old Testament. It's, it's uh, about King David. He was going through a really hard time. You remember his story. He was anointed king, but he didn't become king for a long time. In fact, after he was anointed king and before he became king, most of the time he was running for his life because people wanted to kill him. And one of those times, he was sort of hiding out in a cave because he was discouraged and he was down and everyone wanted to kill him. And then uh, it says this in 1 Samuel 23. It says, And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. And last Sunday when Jen and I were praying, this is the verse that, that God brought to my mind. And sometimes I can be a little dense, but God was just making it really clear. Jonathan went to be with his friend in his dark hour. It's like, okay, I guess I know what you want me to do. Uh, get on a plane, Norman. Um, but... That's, that's what he did. His friend was at the low point. He just showed up. You know, there's a Swedish proverb. I think I've shared it before. It says this. It says, shared joy is double joy. Shared sorrow is half sorrow. And I don't think the exact math is really the point. The point is that in grief, the physical proximity of someone you love helps. It doesn't change anything in actuality, but it helps. And as my friend said this week, the darkness isn't as dark. Um, so that, that just gives you a little insight into where my heart has been this week. Um, you know, grief is universal. So you might be walking through something this morning. You might be walking next to somebody who's going through something. If neither of those are true, just hold on. It, it will be the case at some point. Um, but just that reminder that we'd be a community that, that grieves in hope. And that we'd be a community that sort of runs to each other uh, when, when sorrow comes. So that was for free. That, that's not what you came and, and paid for this morning. Um, but uh, but I, I felt like I just had to share some of that. But we are going to get into Colossians. Hopefully you're still there in chapter 2.
Um, we've been in Colossians for a little while now, and um, you'll remember last week we sort of got to one of these sort of main themes that shows up in Colossians. And it's this theme of Paul wanting to warn these believers to resist false teaching. Uh, this false teaching that's all around them. And, uh, you know, so we, last week we sort of fleshed out what they were dealing with, the false teaching that was around them. But then we sort of said, well, what kind of false teaching exists around us? And we sort of noted kind of three different sort of popular false teachings that are around us. Anyone remember any of them? I'll sort of put you on the side. Yeah, the prosperity gospel, how uh, that's sort of around us, this sort of lie that says, if you're following God, your life will have sort of an upward trajectory, um, which isn't scriptural. Any, anyone remember the others? Yes, easy believism, that, you know, you trust Christ, and it doesn't really matter how you live. Um, that's sort of a prominent uh, one. And then we talked about one other one, the performance gospel. Uh, this idea that God is a little bit more happy with me, the little bit better I'm doing, or the little bit more committed or more dedicated I am. Um, and so we sort of talked through this idea of false teaching. Um, and our point really last week was that uh, we used the picture, if you remember, of uh, sort of a running back getting the ball of truth and trying to like run straight through the line. The only way you're going to run through that hound of people trying to tackle you is if you stay close to your lead blocker. And we said, you know, Jesus is our lead blocker. It's only as we stay close to him that we can sort of resist this false teaching that's trying to take us out. And so that was, that was really the point last week is uh, resist the false teaching, stay close to your lead blocker. Now, this passage this week, which obviously comes right out after the one we looked at last week, is really going to answer the question, why? Why should we stick close to Christ? Why is he the one we should stick close to? What is it that he offers to us? These are the kinds of uh, questions that we get to in Colossians chapter 2. Verse 9 is going to talk about who Jesus is. Verse 10 is going to talk about what Jesus offers to us. And then verses 11 to 15, which we won't be able to get all into today, it's going to sort of explain how Jesus accomplished this for us. None of this was new to the Colossians. And none of this is going to be new to us today, but Paul knew how important repetition is in sort of uh, appropriating truth and sort of resisting falsehood. It, it's needed to sort of rehearse truth. And so that's, that's what this morning is going to be. It's going to be who Jesus is, what he offers, and how he accomplished it. Okay, so look at verse 9 with me. First question, who Jesus is. Verse 9 says this, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Now, this is basically a reiteration of the... The same idea that we saw in chapter 1, uh, verse 19. I'll put both those verses up there together. You can see how close they are. Paul is sort of pulling this verse out of that Christ hymn and sort of reiterating it. Verse 19 says, uh, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. You can see all the repeated words, all and the fullness. Even the word dwell is actually in both. In, in chapter 2 it translates lives, but it's really that same word, dwells. And that, that word dwells is significant because in the Old Testament, God's presence is often talked about as dwelling. It dwelled in the tabernacle. It dwelled in the temple, God's presence. Uh, look at Psalm 68. It says, Why gaze in envy, you rugged mountain, at the mountain where God chooses to reign, where the Lord himself will dwell forever? God's presence, it used to dwell in a place. And what Paul's saying now is, no, all the fullness of that now dwells in a person, in Jesus' body. It rests in who he is. Uh, you know, I used, to, I used to live in Turkey for a year, and when I lived there, I'd often hear uh, this sort of line of thinking. You may have heard something like it. Um, my Turkish friends would say to me, okay, so you're a Christian. You know how you look at Jews. You look at them and you say, you guys stop short. Oh, yeah. As Christians, we look at Jews and say, Jesus came. You, you kind of stopped before Jesus. You just need to come to that next step. Well, my Muslim friends would say to me, you Christians, stop short. Here, you, you trusted Jesus, but then you sort of stopped, and, and here came Muhammad next. You, you stopped short. They would sort of say that same line of thinking to me. And, um, you know, Mormons would say the same thing. They would say, you stopped short. Joseph Smith came with this new revelation from God. 
Um, now that logic makes a lot of sense if Moses and if Jesus and Muhammad and Joseph Smith are sort of all in the same league, in the same sort of category as different prophets of God. But what this verse says is Jesus is unlike anyone else. He's not just another prophet. He's not just a good teacher or a moral reformer. Jesus has all the fullness of who God is dwelling in him. He is God in the flesh, the mystery of the incarnation. Jesus is totally unique, which is why, well, first let me say this. So uh, this past week when I was flying home and I got to Germany, um, there was sort of like this life-size statue of Albert Einstein. He was just sort of like sitting on a bench and people were sitting down next to him and taking their picture with him. I should have gotten my, my picture taken with him. But, um, you know, it made me think, if, uh, imagine you were in grade school and your teacher said to you, hey, we're going to do a group project, and, and Albert Einstein's in your class with you. We're going to do a group project, uh, group up with somebody, and this is going to be pairs. And you, like, you paired up with Albert Einstein. <coughs> you know, say there was still more time. You're not going to say, you know what, I'm going to find better than Albert Einstein. I'm going to go find somebody else to group up with. No, if you get paired with Albert Einstein, you're, you're going to stop. You're done. He's the one you want to be paired up with. Now, there's no real comparison, but once, we, once Christ has come, God in the flesh, and revealed God's purposes to us, you don't move on from it. He has revealed what is needed to know. There is no more revelation beyond Jesus Christ and what he has revealed to us. We don't need to look any further. Amen. And that's, that's a little bit what's going on here. This is who Jesus is. He's God in the flesh, all the fullness of the deity dwelling in bodily form. That's why we don't look any further than, than him. That's who he is. Now, verse 10 tells us what he offers us. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. So all the fullness of the deity dwells in Jesus, and then in Jesus, we have been brought into that fullness. This repeated word of uh, this word fullness, I think, really helps us understand what some of the false teachers were saying in this church. They were saying, if you really want to be complete, if you really want to be full, you have to look beyond Jesus. You have Jesus is fine, okay, but if you want real fullness, you have to do these other things. And Paul's saying, no, that's not true. Jesus is the full expression of God, and in Him we have been brought into that fullness. You've heard of the of FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. Uh, we all have a healthy dose of that, right? We don't like to feel like we're missing out on anything. And I think that's what these false teachers were sort of latching on to. If we, if we can get people to feel like they're missing out, there's a little bit more to the spiritual life that you're not experiencing. And you can have that by going and doing these other things over here. You know, think of all the other ways that you and I try to chase fulfillment in life. We don't necessarily stop following Jesus. We just pursue other things along with Jesus. You know, we look to these other things to try to bring this fullness in our life. Think of, think of some of what they are. Sometimes it's, it's beauty of, of looking a certain way thinking if we can just obtain that certain look or reach that certain physical goal, then we'll really be fulfilled. And true fulfillment is sort of just outside of our reach. Some, maybe it's not beauty. Maybe it's more power. If I can just accumulate a little bit more wealth or a little bit uh, more uh, reputation or move up the corporate ladder. Whatever it is, we look to these other things to try to bring fulfillment. And what Paul is saying here is, no, in Christ, you've already been brought to fullness. You don't need to look any further. You see his logic. In Jesus is all the fullness, and there isn't another level of fulfillment or spirituality that we need to reach through other methods. It's already ours in Christ. He says, you have been brought to fullness. It's a perfect tense verb, which means it's happened in the past, and yet the effects of it are still going on into the present. The problem is, is we forget it. We forget that we've been brought to fullness and we try to pursue it, pursue this fulfillment through other ways. 
You know, if you were to throw me a ball up here, I'd probably catch it. But if you were to throw me two balls at the same time, not only would I not catch both of them, I'd probably catch neither of them. Have you ever tried that? Someone throw you two things at once? You, you can't focus on both, so you focus on neither, and you drop both of them. I think that's kind of what Paul's saying here. Is in Christ you've been brought to fulfillment, but if you start to look to anything else outside of Christ, you, you kind of lose both. And, and you go backwards. And you don't experience the, the fullness you're looking for. It's already ours, but if we try to look to other things, this fulfillment we, we long for sort of slips through our fingers. The rest of verse 10, uh, I'll just put up there, it sort of reiterates what we've already talked about, about who Jesus is. He's the head over every power and authority. There's no power, earthly or spiritual, that can even come close to Jesus' power. So Paul says, stick close to your lead blocker. Why? Because of who he is. He's God in the flesh. All the fullness of the deity dwells in him. And why else should you stick close to him? Because of what he offers. He offers fullness. A state of fullness that we all long for. We can find that in him. Now in the next several verses, what Paul does is he sort of turns his attention to how Jesus made this possible for us. What, what did Jesus do that made it possible for us to have this state of fullness in him? But it's kind of confusing, because what Paul does, he uses sort of these, these pictures that are kind of foreign to us. He uses uh, these metaphors of circumcision and baptism, and even some of the grammar in here can be misleading. Uh, so let's get into it a little bit, and we're actually going to sort of finish this paragraph uh, next week. But how did Jesus make this state of fullness for us possible? Let's look at verse 11. It says, In him... You were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Right. Now, a couple things to know. Uh, he's talking about a spiritual circumcision. This is metaphorical. Um, some, it, some of the false teachers in this church, they must have been telling these Gentile believers... Okay, it's great you're following Jesus, but if you really want to be a recipient of all the promises of God, then you need to do what the Old Testament says, and you, as a Gentile, need to be circumcised. That, that must have been what they were saying, and Paul says, no, it's not about physical surgery. It's not about where a piece of flesh is removed. No, it's, it's a spiritual surgery that takes place, where our hearts are radically changed. Where you go from being ruled by the flesh to being ruled by the Spirit. And that happens in this circumcision of Christ. Now here's where some of the confusion comes in. Sort of the last phrase. Uh, the self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Now you probably see a little footnote in your Bible there. And there's an alternate reading. Um, which if you look down, it, it, actually the more literal reading of this verse uh, let me find it. Yeah, if you see the footnote, it'll say, in the circumcision of Christ. So let me just put the, the more literal version on the screen. Because the NIV kind of makes an interpretive uh, step here. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off in the circumcision of Christ. Now what does that mean? What are we talking about? Well, that sort of construction, the circumcision of Christ, it's, you, you kind of have to make a decision. Is Christ the... Subject or the object of this circumcision? Well, the NIV says Christ is the subject. And it says, okay, this is a circumcision that Christ performed. But I don't think that's the best way to read this. I think Christ is the object of this circumcision here. So let me just put this on the screen so you'll see it. It says, your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off in Christ's circumcision. Meaning, in Jesus' death. That in Jesus' death is when our spiritual circumcision took place, when our flesh was sort of dealt with. Here's how one commentator describes this verse. He says, The circumcision of Christ is a graphic metaphor. It refers to the circumcision that Christ underwent in his crucifixion when his physical body was violently stripped off in his death. Christ's death, it was physical, it was horrific, but it was in his physical death that our spiritual surgery took place. We experience this spiritual circumcision because 
Because Jesus underwent his horrific physical death. I think that's what verse 11 is talking about. And I think it becomes really clear when you see it with verse 12. Because for Paul, these core elements of the gospel always go together. Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. Well, that's if you put verse 12 with it, you see that's what he's talking about. He's, he's talking about all three. He says, your flesh was put off in Christ's circumcision, so talking about his death, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through your faith in the working of God. For Paul, these three go together. This is the rehearsal of the gospel. He does this other places, most famously in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, you'll be familiar with this passage. Paul says this, he says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel you're saved if you hold firmly to the word, the word I preached to you. Otherwise you believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the yeah. third day according Ooh. to the scriptures. It's the same three elements that we see in Colossians 2. This is the heart of the gospel. It's Christ's death, it's his burial, his resurrection. And these are all the events that we're going to spend this week sort of remembering and rehearsing um, and celebrating. These important events in history that not only we remember, but spiritually we participate in them. And, and that's how Christ made it possible for us to experience this fullness in him. So that's sort of Paul's line of thinking, which can be really hard to trace sometimes. Uh, these false teachers were saying, no, you need something else outside of Christ to really have fullness. And Paul says, no, no, no. Jesus is the fullness of God. We've been brought into this fullness. And the way Jesus made that possible <laughs> is through his death, his burial, and his resurrection and our participation in them. So this week, we're going to focus on, on how Jesus made that possible. We're going to focus on his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But today, I want us just to sit with the idea that we've been brought to fullness. Mm. That that's our identity right now in Christ. For those of us who've trusted Christ, we don't need anything else to be complete. You are delighted by your Heavenly Father. He looks at you with love. You're complete in Him. God's not withholding His love from you until you get your act together. He couldn't be more pleased. We are full in Christ. So just let that idea that I am full in Christ sink in. What does that do to your heart? What does that stir up in your soul? This idea that I am I'm full in Christ. I hope one thing it enables you to do, it enables me to do, is just to take a deep breath. To sort of, for a second, stop the continual striving that often shapes our lives. To realize, I'm okay. Exactly as I am because of what Jesus has done. And then I also hope it just stirs up a, a radical sort of gratitude in our hearts. Because it's a gift. And when we receive a gift, we respond in thanks. Mm -hmm. We are full in Christ. We're going to sing and, and praise God for that, but let me, let me pray for us before we go. <coughs>